welcome to this Convincing Matters chat. And this session is the September 2022 Convincing News Review. Welcome to Convincing Matters with Lorraine and Stu. Join us for a chat about all things property. So, Stu, September 2022 News Review already. Can't believe that time's going that quickly, can you? No, I can't. You know, when you think we're just doing this on the back of, uh, is it, what do you call it, the anniversary? A year ago almost, uh, it was the end of the stamp duty holiday. So oh. uh, can you believe a whole year has gone? I know, I know, I know. Well, probably the first and most important piece of news, Stu, of course, you know, absolutely been flagrant advertising here. We've got another Convincing Matters Live coming up, haven't we? We sure have. Yeah, 8th of November in London we'll give everyone more details and we'd love to see everybody there uh, but we will do some separate guff about that but uh, to jump into the news it's a fairly mixed bag this month and um, of course everybody's um, you know had the national period of mourning following the death of the Queen uh, and just one sort of point to note really which is one of you know at least works in firms favors on the old priority periods Stu but in case anybody missed it because Monday the 19th of September was our impromptu national bank holiday. It is worth firms just noting that um, uh, you know priority periods will be extended by one working day um, uh, if they were um, uh, began before the nineteenth um, of um, September and expire after the nineteenth of September, twenty twenty two. So just one for firms to note. Really, I don't want to say anything more about it than that, but uh, just worth noting that that um, firms do have an extra day or so. So, well, you mentioned stamp duty at the outset, uh, yep. at the outset, Stu. So, uh, so go on. What have you got to tell us? Well, we've got quite big news regarding stamp duty, haven't we? Um, whether it makes much difference, I'm not sure. But uh, obviously, the stamp duty thresholds have been increased or put back, whatever you want to call it. So, indefinitely as well this time, not a holiday. Yes, yeah, so the stamp duty land tax, no holiday. Um, yeah, I mean, what the Chancellor did in his seemingly, uh, and I say this without any political side, but seemingly <laughs> now much maligned mini budget or fiscal statement or whatever it was that uh, uh, the threshold of course at which stamp, uh, buyers um, begin to pay stamp duty land tax is going to go up from 125,000 to 250,000 uh, and first time buyers um, aren't going to have to pay uh, stamp duty land tax if the property costs less than 425 uh, and then there's a sort of um, a, a, a relief above that probably worth just pointing out that um you know, the government's often on a bit of a lag with its stamp duty land tax calculator, Stu, isn't it? Um, in the, Most definitely, um, yeah. I wouldn't be relying on that anytime soon, definitely. No, it took them a while to update it, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, and, of course, I think it's just fair to sort of point out to colleagues that they do need to keep their ear to the ground on on these sort of government and fiscal changes because it does seem at the moment that, uh, that you know, we are in a state of sort of flux on finances generally. We've obviously done the chat last week about uh, about the, the difficulties with mortgage offers and of course just because a stamp duty land tax cut has been made to of course it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to stay in force for very long so um I don't, so I, think, do... I don't think it will I think we might be seeing a, a, a change on this in the not too distant future maybe yeah I, I I tend to agree with you I just think firms have got to stay on top of it and it's worth yeah. pointing out for CQS uh, accredited firms so for SRA regulated firms there is now a specific that has been for a while I must say a, a specific requirement in the core practice management standards that firms actually um, essentially sort of track any changes to stamp duty levels across a transaction so um, you know we do all I think need to be keeping quite a close eye on that so what caught your eye next to so uh, we discussed earlier before we came on didn't we um, Plexa and the First remortgage that's been completed. Yeah, so Pexa, this uh, this platform um, that, that that originated uh, that, that originated in Australia, yeah. and um, they, uh, as you say, they've completed a remortgage essentially, um, you know, digitally, as far as I'm as far as I understand, um, and um, they've actually acquired Optima Legal. Um, so it's clear, I think, they're quite serious about coming in the market. And obviously, when we spoke to our lovely Australian colleague, when we did our Australia Around the World um, uh, chat, Stu, they, of course, mentioned PEXA as the sort of financial yeah. platform. Uh, and it seems they are, you know, coming into the UK market very seriously. So 
I think that would be one to watch, won't it? Most definitely. I think, though, it's the same. You know, I think, um, uh, as with all sort of conveyancing related tech, um, I think, you know, the market is very fragmented. And um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for all of these organisations. It's getting enough critical mass yeah, um, that, that, that yours becomes the the the, the default product yeah. or, or or position really, and I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, watch this space. I thought it was worth pointing out, Stu, and I see it fairly regularly because I keep an eye out. But it's always, you know, um, and again, this isn't conveyancing related specifically, but uh, given the pressure that conveyances are under, it's probably worth mentioning. Um, but um, an experienced solicitor was struck off, uh, therefore can't practice anymore, uh, essentially for, um, you know, uh, verifying client signatures on a form when, uh, in actual fact, she hadn't seen the client sign. This uh, happened to be, um, uh, you know, in relation to a form allowing one parent to take their children out of jurisdiction and of course that all unrolled unraveled when when things went wrong there but the, you know the bottom line is i mean this to be fair this lady and i do understand the moment of madness thing i really do you know she said she'd have to and i quote you know live the rest of her life with the stigma of being a disgraced solicitor she was truly a sorry but fundamentally Stu, i think people forget these days and i think with digital signatures and everything else it's very easy to be Complacent, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is, but at the end of the day, you know, we're lawyers, and saying you've witnessed some, a signature when you haven't, or a very experienced legal exec of 20 years standing again was recently um, uh, given a rap on the knuckles and can't now practice without the SRA's consent essentially. Um, because he essentially sort of you know uh, backdated a, a lasting power of attorney. Because mm. the certificate providers and the and the attorney did, and, and the donor didn't sign at the same time, so this is something I see quite regularly. And I really just wanted to remind our conveyancer colleagues that you know backdating a document, witnessing a document where you haven't seen the signatory sign is dishonesty, because of it's course. making a representation of, of something that's not actually the case. So, um, yeah. I think also maybe uh, when you're receiving this document type to actually check it's been witnessed properly. Uh, we've seen a a flood of documents recently where for whatever reason and despite the fact that we tell clients to get the witness properly you know not a family member that kind of thing um they're coming back you know not witness properly even not signed or um, you know somebody maybe with the same surname so i think actually checking the document and checking the witness part really important and yeah, actually that really, really does important. that's a really good point actually Stu, and that does to tie into something that's very convincing related because um a lot of firms now sort of rather insist on seeing um, a lot of buyers firms, you know, insist on seeing a, uh, a transfer signed in escrow. So in readiness for completion prior to actually well, prior to completion, if not prior to exchange, um, again, to make sure that on completion, you're going to get a transfer that's properly signed and witnessed. And I have to say, I think as as a moment of risk management, I think that's a very good, good thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you get a bit of I see a bit of sort of, you know, uh, oh, I don't know, a bit of sort of complaint on social media from people who say, well, you know, surely uh, surely that can be used for fraud. Well, not actually if it's got draft written across it in, you know, felt it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible to do it. You're only sending a scan. If you've written draft across, you know, both pieces, the point is for the, for the buyer's conveyance to actually just see if it's been properly signed and witnessed. And I think the point is, Stu, we now know, and, and, and certainly I think you and I, you know, are of the generation, and I know I'm so much older than you, but, um, you know, probably 20 years ago, if we hadn't got a document properly signed and witnessed, we know that we could contact the, the, the lawyer on the other side and it would get sorted pretty quickly. And I hate to say it, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Definitely um, not, no. No. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a huge amount of sympathy for people actually wanting to check that documents have been properly signed and witnessed prior to them actually being relied on. I think the pressures, the pressures are greater as well, aren't they? The pressure for, yeah. for example, for registering something, you know, they're, they're far greater than they ever were. So yeah. trying to sort something out retrospectively is too difficult and, and well, too risky. And for all we know, you know, the, um, you know, the seller might have moved to the Bahamas anyway or died. 
Um, so, you know, it's not something, it's not a bit of admin. And the Land Reds have quite clearly said in recent years too, they are looking much more closely at, uh, at witnessing of documents um, uh, and looking out for fraud and all the rest of it. Um, and, uh, and certainly I, you know, I think I might have told you this before, but I, um, when I was locoming, I got a transfer in, had a quick look at it, you know, appeared to be signed, popped it on the file. Then I, something clicked and about two hours later I opened the file and it was, I looked at it again and it was perfectly witnessed, but um, no signatures, no, sig yeah. you, know, the, you know, the transferors hadn't signed it. Yeah. So, you know, and I think however simple we try to make those instructions for clients to start, as to how to sign they just don't engage they don't mm. want to read it and um you know there's a lot there's a lot wrapped up in that so definitely yeah i think uh, i think um uh, some good points in there really um so law society produce a fair bit of good old content stew um yeah. i think actually clc regulated firms should be looking at what the law society produces by way of guidance and i and, yeah. and vice versa um, so uh, anything caught your eye recently? I think there's a few bits, aren't there? So firstly, there's a, a been a Q&A Q uh, about the use of Bitcoin uh, on mm. property purchase. So another subject that's certainly not going to be going away anytime soon, is it? No, absolutely not. Um, and um, uh, I think a lot of firms haven't there. I mean, I'd be interested. What's, what's um, PCS's view on sort of, you know, bit, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, Stu, in relation to... <laughs> Uh, you know, putting those towards the, you know, funds for a purchase. I think there's two, you've got to be sort of, you've got to separate it down, haven't you? There's two different um, parts to this puzzle. Um, there's accepting Bitcoin as a payment, which is completely different to a client's source of funds coming from um, investment in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so uh, certainly here we, we don't accept uh, Bitcoin. We're not at that stage yet. Um, I'm sure in the future firms will have to. Um, there'll be too much of a calling for it. But at the moment, um, we certainly don't. We don't know enough about it. Um, but, but in terms of, you know, clients' funds and where it comes from, obviously Bitcoin now is going to become something that's going to pop up again and again and again, isn't it? Because there are people making a lot of money from Bitcoin. Yeah, I think so. I just think what convincing firms need to do is, you know, at the higher level, consider the risk, come up with a policy and make sure everybody understands what the policy is. And maybe for a lot of firms at the moment, that may well be, um, we're not going to accept this. Just then then yeah. you've, you've eliminated the risk or mitigated it to the extent possible. Uh, I mean, the Law Society said, uh, and it's a useful bit of um, uh, uh, of content, actually. But the Law Society say um, you may consider that a significant risk in this transaction is that the Bitcoin may Bitcoin may be derived from criminal activity. You would need to take steps to establish the original funds to use uh, to buy the Bitcoin from legitimate sources. Place, yeah. um, consider whether the crypto provider is reputable and regulated by the FCA. Um, and to be fair, you know, the law sock, I think, make the point that we obviously would echo, Stu, you know, if, if you, that's the firm, consider you don't have sufficient skills or time to undertake the necessary checks and analysis, consider whether you should decline to act on the basis you cannot adequately manage the money laundering and other risks. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably where at the moment a lot of firms would be on this. But it does come back to this challenge all the time, doesn't it, of actually understanding in the first place, you know, where your money is and where it sounds a very obvious thing to say but yeah i think the goal per post will move on this quite quickly though because we've had the luxury haven't we of having so much work that you know we, we can turn work away and i think the key on not just crypto and bitcoin but basically source of funds is actually doing a proper risk assessment right at the start when you're quoting a client and asking those questions where did the money come from and of course you know, if, if you know it's coming from uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency and you don't know enough about it, and it's a case of actually not taking that work on, whether as we go forward with a, a, a potential market drop, that changes. And of course, the volume of people, uh, I suspect, that um, realise money from cryptocurrency massively increasing. Uh, I think it's very much going to be watch this space. And I'm assuming that, you know, it, it won't be too much longer and we'll all have to heavily educate ourselves a lot more on, on on the usage of it. But I think you hit the nail on the head. If you don't know enough about it, then you're taking a risk, aren't you? 
yeah, and I, I suspect those two, you know, what, what we will be reading about before we all have an understanding and acceptance. I hate to say it, but what I think we'll be reading about first is uh, is firms getting caught with their pants down who did take the work on, did take the risk and didn't understand the source. And that's the problem. Um, and I actually think that's the way that it will go, unfortunately. I think firms will feel under pressure. My advice to conveyancers, to the coalface conveyancers, is for goodness sake, if you are acting on a purchase, particularly if you're still working at home, you're not sort of you know, supported in the sense of being in the office and having people around you. You can't go and knock on somebody's door at the end of the day. If you are presented with a purchase and at the beginning of that transaction, you don't know and understand what your client is telling you about their source of funds, then for goodness sake, don't do any work until you've asked, found out, gone and spoke to someone else in your firm, spoke to your money laundering reporting officer, just understand what your firm's procedures are. I mean, that would be my you know, my plea to the coalface conveyancer. Um, there, are, there are actually firms out there now that will give you um, some sort of certificate regarding the validity of this currency. You can actually outsource the check-in of this. I don't know enough about it myself, and I'm sure some of the viewers may well have used some of these firms, but potentially in the future, that might be something that pops up. Um, I, I certainly don't know enough about it. We haven't done enough of it here me to give any kind of advice or, or representation on that but i know there are more you know more than one firm now that will do that for you i think the issue again though is to just to sort of carry on the carry on this tangent a bit but i do you know there isn't really any part of the conveyancing process you can't outsource now or, mm -hmm. or you know and i think what firms need to understand is that um and i sometimes wonder whether they do is that still the responsibility if something goes wrong with that outsourced provider or that outsourced product, work, whatever, is that the liability and the risk still lies with the firm. You may that consider that outsourcing it mitigates the risk to some extent, and in many ways I'm sure it probably does, but the responsibility will always lie with the firm and therefore the firm's professional indemnity insurance if something goes wrong. And I do think that's kind of worth remembering uh, because I think a lot of firms forget, quite frankly. Uh, well, and kind of speaking of risk, that's almost sort of seamlessly and an indemnity that seamlessly and completely accidentally uh, run very briefly into my next, um, uh, you know, sort of tiny in passing sort of uh, news point, which really actually is only going to be relevant, I think, to anybody who's, uh, well, I think it is relevant to all solicitors, really, uh, whatever stage you're, uh, of, um, of, of practice you're in. But um, there. Uh, the Solicitors Indemnity Fund is is a fund that's is, uh, that's existed for many years to basically provide sort of you know protection for consumers after um, a solicitor sort of ceases being in business. The SRA decided to abolish it, but couldn't then decide what to replace it with. Um, but the SRA has now announced that it's going to um, that it's going to run um, an SRA run indemnity scheme, but there's absolutely no detail on it at all. Uh, lots of commentators have said, well, the SI, you know, the SIF, if it ain't broke, why did you want to fix it? Um, and as I say, to be fair, I don't want to spend any time talking about it, Stu, but because lots of people at the coalface of conveyancing, this isn't going to have any impact on them at all. But I do think it's um, it's uh, it, it's worth pointing out that, you know, as firms close, as people want to retire, as people want to stop doing this job, um, you know, how clients are going to be protected and the and the absolute swinging cost of um, runoff insurance is, is something that can't be underestimated, I think. But there we go. So, Stu, what's next on your list? Well, are we actually going to talk about the SRA's guidance on sexual misconduct cases yeah you've been looking forward you were quite you were quite excited about bringing this one up weren't you well i'm not, no. I'm not so sure about the relevance but <laughs> no uh, again i just think it's one of those really useful pieces of guidance for everybody to have a look at um because the sra has issued guidance actually on the um, 4th of september in case anyone's interested um just on you know, sexual misconduct more generally. And actually, this was brought about, brought about because of um, a seeming very uh, difference in approach uh, between, for example, the, uh, you know, the regulators of the bar of barristers uh, and pretty much everybody else. Um, I, I thought what was interesting is the XRA reported that the, um, the number of complaints about sexual misconduct at law firms has risen significantly. And the SRA reports since 2018, there have been 251 
reports relating to potential sexual misconduct compared to 30 in the preceding five years. Now, I suppose the point is that maybe a lot more people now feel able to report. Um, mm. You know, I suspect that it's, I can certainly say without, you know, um, any shadow of a doubt, you know, that in practice over the years, not you know, I've been subjected to, you know, completely unacceptable behaviour from partners and, and clients and, uh, and you know, um, I got absolutely, you know, when I was a trainee, I got no support from a partner at all. But the reason I wanted to really just point this out to firms and people in firms, I do just think the whole sexual misconduct thing, it can be very difficult. It can be very difficult when, uh, you know, everybody's out having a good time. You know, the Christmas party scene is upon us. Everybody's got back from their summer holidays. They're thinking about booking Christmas parties, maybe the first one for three or four, two or three years. And Stu, I just think firms... And their staff need to just think very carefully about this stuff. I think that's... I think it just goes hand in hand in the fact that, you know, we hold a professional qualification uh, and that means there are professional standards, whether it's, you know, in, in any kind of ilk, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But just, again, CRC um, regulated firms and SRA regulated firms might just be interested to know that that's out there. Um I just wanted to also remind firms that the um, SRA has um, pointed out that it's going to be doing more checks um, on uh, firms' websites to make sure it's properly, um, uh, you know, firms are properly sort of quote, you know, putting their fees and estimates and costs estimates and information that's required on their websites. Um, they're doing a rolling program of checks uh, under the transparency rules. And I think it's perhaps fair to say that, um, you know, I suspect the CLC may be doing a very similar exercise with CLC regulated firms. They haven't, you know, they haven't said yes or no, Stu, but um, uh, but remember that the transparency rules, they do cover work other than conveyancing, but it does include details of the services offered, who delivers the services and the pricing. So there's quite a lot packaged up in the transparency rules there. Um, uh, so anything else for you, Stu? Um, I think there was a, a CLC consultation we noticed in the news um, about, um, well, we were confused about this one, weren't we? Um, it was about knowing each customer, fine, um, treating them fairly, uh, keeping their money safe, um, and obviously acting in their best interests, which we kind of briefly spoke about this, didn't we, before? Um, and it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you would assume under our regulation and our professional duty that all of this is completely covered. Yeah, well, I would have thought so. I mean, the CLC, as you say, is thinking of including, if, if is consulting on introducing an entirely new principle requiring licensed conveyances to do those things. And I agree, Stu, I just think it's interesting that they feel the need to say it. Yeah. I would have thought we would have been expected to do all those things, but, but there we go. Um, but maybe, maybe again, sort of, you know, seamless segue, but maybe... Um, the reputational damage thing when something goes wrong is is something that we need to think about. And maybe, you know, thinking about keeping the money safe. I mean, we've still got, we're still seeing 12 months on, you know, the fallout from, um, of course, the Simplify um, uh, hack, mm. which uh, you mentioned uh, off air just before we started, um, to, you know, recording. And, um, you know, another big, Another big outfit has recently closed its conveyancing department, and I feel most for the people at the coalface, of course, anybody losing their job as a result of that. Lots of, uh, you know, a large number of them have been able to transfer to another firm. But I think the point is, you know, um, again, there's been lots of fallout, lots of complaints, uh, a complete lack of um, information, it would appear, and, and lots of reputational damage. So maybe you know, treating fairly and keeping money safe in the light of those sorts of big, big conveyancing news stories, Stu, is, is perhaps where the CLC is coming from. I don't know. But, um, I just thought it would be worth mentioning that um, the CQS, the Conveyancing Quality Scheme, has been updated. Firms should now be complying, Stu. Uh, I know that you're not covered by it, but lots of uh, our you know, lots of our viewers will be as SRA regulated firms. Firms should have been complying now with this stuff since the 1st of May, Stu, but, you know, there are beefed up requirements for source of funds and source of wealth, um, the requirement for documented individual AML risk assessment, 
beefed up requirements for tracking the SDLT monitoring and changing across the file, which I've already mentioned, uh, beefed up requirements regarding the lender being your client, something I know that's, you know, you talk mm. about a lot, and a new procedure actually um, um, relating to minimising the risk of receiving avoidable requisitions from the land reg. So there's a lot in there for conveyances to grapple with. And the thing I would simply be saying to conveyancing firms and to people watching this is, if you haven't had anything from your head of conveyancing about more on source of funds and source of wealth, more on assessing risk, changes to stamp duty land tax, lender requirements, avoidable requisitions, then I either you're doing it all, and fantastic if you are, or uh, uh, somebody higher up in the firm needs to be thinking about uh, reviewing the firm's procedures as a result of the updated CQS requirements. So just worth um, just worth pointing that out. So come on, Stu, we've got, well, surely we've got to mention in passing the um, the land registry 2022 to 25 business plan. Oh, the land registry is still um, it's the right way of putting this. I'm not even sure if I can articulate it. It's still something that's causing us major headaches. Um, you know, the delays still seem to be there. Um, I'm not sure how far it's moved on from where we were six months ago. It has, um, I don't think, really. No. I just, I really struggle. I mean, the Land Registry, you know, is an extraordinary organisation. It's got some extraordinary people working there. And the customer satisfaction ratings have always been when you're dealing with somebody at the cold face of the land of the land reg consistently high but the land reg you know they've put out a very punchy business plan um they expect you know everything to be digitized they're all expecting seven out of ten updates to the land register to be automated by march 2025 and they're still migrating the data uh from land charges departments in local authority to the land reg so they are excuse the puns to you doing a massive land grab but the land registry's own figures at well July it has been updated now. But um, on by their own admission, um, uh, we complete over half of complex op 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 applications such as first registrations and creation of new leases and transfers of part in just under ten months, and we complete most in just over thirteen months. So today, Stu, you could be receiving a requisition on a matter that you completed a this year. This is what's now. really difficult, isn't it? It's great, you know, the projections that we receive and it's great to hear the plans that they have in place and, and obviously we're all for that. But it's very difficult when they're I'm not saying the uh, delay's been ignored, but let's just say not maybe addressed and certainly publicly. I um, think it's, the land reg will stand up quite rightly and say, well, we're putting lots of resource into, uh, into um you know, frontline registrations and, and we're employing more people and we accept that after the last financial crash, you know, we we cut our staffing back far too far and we've been paying catch up ever since. That's what they would say, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think, though, if resource is at, at a premium, then surely your raison d'etre is land registration and supporting the property yeah. market. And of course, investment's got to go elsewhere. I completely get that. But I didn't ever really understand the rationale for the land, uh, the local land charges um, data transfer. Um, and to be honest, you know, and of course they're pouring lots into digitization. Of course they're going to, but I think you've got to be getting the frontline stuff right first. Balance is the right word, isn't it? it um, is. But it's diff I think it's very difficult for us because obviously, you know, the lack of registrations in certain quarters means, you know, you're going to get complaints for your clients um, clients might want to refinance, blah blah blah. Just makes it very difficult for us. Um, it's a, you know, still a, a big snag, isn't it? That's uh, you know left over from that that stamp duty holiday period. Something that we're still dealing with. Yeah, exactly. Um, the Law Society have been punting out lots of uh, of, of helpful content, Stu, and just sort of before we, you know, went close this news um uh, session for this for this month. Um, they've also put out um, a practice note on social media, yeah. which, again, I think is um, useful and interesting for, for anybody, really, that's, that, that's, you know, within the profession. i tell you what I find interesting, what, the sort of conveyancing related. The practice note's thinking about um, increasing understanding of the use of social media in the legal profession and, um, you know, whether you should be doing it. So I'll tell you what I think is quite interesting. People quite, you know, I see conveyances quite rightly putting stuff out there, putting themselves out there on social media and, and damn good luck to them, quite frankly. But 
I think you have a difficulty with slightly displaying your ignorance and and maybe bringing your firm into disrepute if you're not careful. Um, one example I have of that is is somebody I saw on social media who basically you know, thought they were fantastic because um, a completion didn't complete, funds didn't come through, uh, but they thought they were marvellous because um, uh, they got everybody moved on the Friday and decided they would just sort of, you know, do all the funds and everything uh, on the Monday. And they thought that was great. And they had no, absolutely no concept of, of what the, the worry The worrying thing about that is is the amount of people that will like and share and, and, and agree with it as well. I yeah. think, um, this, again, it's a bit of a two-pronged, um discussion this one because i think as people are more and more and more inclined to put themselves out there i think it's really really important that per that firms in general review their social media policy uh, and i think that guidance from the law society is a, is a great starting point and you can use that um to develop your own internal policy because now we have platforms that are so vast don't we from tiktok um you know i can remember probably only 18 months, two years ago, looking on TikTok um, and thinking how many law firms would be on there and, and, and hardly any. But now, of course, um, you know, TikTok being the sort of viable platform um, to Facebook means that all law firms all of a sudden adopted it. Um, so we now have sort of at least, you know, I think TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, you can go on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and I think you know, monitoring those platforms, um, and that's just a selection of the big ones, of course, there are others, um, is, is difficult, isn't it? So having a robust policy yeah. place that's in your your office manual or, or a separate policy that staff sign is, is, is mega important because, of course, the actual risk and implications of information being divulged on public platforms is, is, is huge, isn't it? So It is. Well, and I just worry that a lot of the more junior members of the profession, and I mean no disrespect to them, I've always thought this is very much something that should come from the top. But, you know, if you don't have an understanding of the importance of the duty of confidentiality, for example, you know, and you're taking photos of the gifts you've been sent and, and you know, your client's name's still on the card or whatever, whatever. And, you know, of course, with confidentiality, once it's out there, it's out there. And again, even in the context of our mortgage chat last week, Stu, um, I saw people having a chat, uh, conveyances having a chat on social media saying, well, I thought it was a contract once the mortgage offer was issued. Um, and that, you know, that concerns me for firms, I have to say. Yeah. Um, if, if, if we ever make a post that includes any information whatsoever, whether it be a first name and anything like that, we always get consent from the client. Yeah. Um, and if you haven't got consent from the client, then you cannot use it. Uh, I'm actually amazed at some of the stuff I see from um, certain estate agents and the stuff they post. Um, and I think, Christ, you know, it's you're, you're divulging so much. I've seen literally the, you know, uh, one sort of post um, advertising a street name and then, a second post, somebody's standing outside a door and you can see the door number and things like that. And you think, yeah. God, wow. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of the implications as to, you know, what, what, what you're showing here. Well, I suppose, though, that the answer to that one is we're more heavily regulated and the consequences mm. for us listers and licensed conveyances are much greater if something goes wrong there, Stu. But I think that's just something for firms to think about. And probably the, you know, the penultimate thing, just again, perhaps for... Um, you know, for people higher up in conveyancing firms, the Financial Action Task Force has produced sort of guidance on AML risks in the property industry. So that's out there if anybody, if anybody's interested in reading it. But I think it's actually um, it's useful stuff, you know, for for a dark autumn evening. And uh, well, Stu, shall we finish where we started with you know what? <laughs> you know so, what? Yeah. So what's that then? So what's going to be happening on the eighth of November? Well, to Conveyancing Matters Live. So we'll put some more information out there. We're doing it all again. We enjoyed it so much last time. I think everyone had fun. So hopefully people will join us again. Uh, but this probably is a good time to to wrap up this Conveyancing Matters chat. So uh, lovely to see you again, Stu, and hopefully see you soon. Take care, Lorraine. Take care. Bye. <laughs>